This week's episode is brought to you by Clubhouse. Clubhouse is project management software that's a delight to use. It's fast, it's easy, it allows you to zoom in on your tasks and focus. It has tons of integrations, GitHub, Slack, Sentry, and uh, lots of people are switching to it. I, I posted about it on LinkedIn and got tons of folks like Rodolfo Ram- Ramirez, he's a COO at Swivel, and Nathan Palmer, founder of Crodox. They responded to say they've switched to Clubhouse as well. Find out what all the buzz is about. Go to clubhouse.io slash build and get two months free. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Build Your SaaS. This is the behind the scenes story of building a web app in 2019. I'm John Buda, a software engineer. And I'm Justin Jackson. I do product and marketing. Follow along as we build Transistor.fm. And probably making me a few mistakes (laughs) and fix stuff on a Sunday. (laughs) (laughs) We had a hard weekend, folks. (laughs) I'm tired. Yeah, we're going to get into it. Uh, I think that the working title for this episode is Worst Day Ever. (laughs) <laughs> uh maybe i'll just say one thing which is yeah. this is how it happened this is how it started is uh sunday morning so we're recording this on monday so this is yesterday <laughs> <laughs> it feels like this happened a week ago uh yesterday morning i started getting messages from android users saying they couldn't download episodes and i'm trying to figure it out it just seems like it's happening it's only happening on android and at first, I thought it was only certain apps. We had recently dealt with this other thing with PodTrack where TLS 1.3, which is like the new SSL, right? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's the, new, uh, the new protocol that's like better and faster than the previous one. And, not, and our, uh, the web server we use like automatically kind of upgraded to this and made it the default. Okay. Yeah, so, we, so you had upgraded some stuff. Now we get the new TLS 1.3, which is cutting edge um, kind of security. Although it's not even that new. Like it's Uh, it's just that stuff is so slow to adopt. Yeah. I think it was released officially August 2018. Yeah. So initially I'm thinking it's this TLS incompatibility. Lots of – like Android hasn't upgraded their platform to TLS 1.3. So I thought it was that. So I'm like answering – you know, maybe five to 10 issues from people around what I think is this TLS issue. And then in the afternoon, I just start getting like a ton of messages. And, you know, depending on the weekend, like some weekends I'm away from my computer skiing. Yep. But today I was, you know, yeah, sorry, yesterday I was just, I was on my computer. And so I'm getting all these messages and I'm like, wait a second, something's going on. <laughs> and uh, people are saying, you're, it looks like your SSL cert is expired. And so I'm start message, trying to message John. And John is like doing some sort of meditation retreat in the woods. Or <laughs> I, cannot get, I cannot get a hold of John. And uh, I was freaking out a little bit, but not, not too bad. <laughs> And so Justin thought I sabotaged the system and <laughs> ran away. Yeah, it ran away. Um, so why don't you take it from here? So what? Yeah, what happened? And so what happened? Yeah, it was basically like a chain reaction of bad events that happened at the same time. I think. Yeah. Um, the the thing related to TLS one point three is is a problem. Mm-hmm. Uh, for in certain situations, though our our server does also support TLS 1.2, like simultaneously, it's sort of like okay, it'll when, roll when back some, to that when someone requ- when someone when a, another site or a browser requests something from our site, it will try to negotiate like the best the best protocol that they both that you both support mm-hmm. and use that. Um, but it's still an issue in certain instances. Yeah. So I was like, okay, well, that, that can be fixed, whatever. And then, so we, we upgraded a, a while ago back in December to uh, Caddy, which is a web server that does automatic 
um, SSL certificates through Let's Encrypt. Yeah. So we can do custom domains for our customers on their websites. Uh, but that certificate, that the Caddy also provides our SSL certificate for Transistor.fm. Mm-hmm. And so the one benefit of Caddy is that it's supposed to automatically renew your Let's Encrypt certificates uh, like 30 days before they expire because they last for 90 days, Mm -hmm. which was, you know, I think we, I rolled this out around Christmas, which would be 90 days, you know, Mm -hmm. previous to today, this weekend. Yeah. (laughs) That makes sense. The timing lines Uh, up. (laughs) For some reason, which I'm still determining, uh, Caddy did not automatically renew our certificate. Yeah. And I had gotten emails from Let's Encrypt that was like, hey, your certificate's expiring in 30 days. And I'm like, yeah, that's fine. Mm -hmm. It'll be handled. Yeah, we got it handled. Uh, And it didn't. (laughs) Sure didn't. So. (laughs) By the way, I think this is, this is just a a rite of passage for any web app. But it just it's just a, it's just frustrating. Like it just sucks that it was down for as long as it was because even even fixing it should have been simple. But but that took hours lo- like a couple hours longer than I wanted to for a number of reasons. Like I just couldn't. There was no easy way to say, "Hey, regenerate this mm-hmm. right now." Yeah, yeah. Um, so I kind of had to like wipe things clean as far as like. Not any of our data or anything, like everyone's podcasts are obviously fine, but um, sort of had to wipe like all the certificates that were stored on our servers temporarily um, and just let them kind of regenerate as they were being requested. Gotcha. Again, which is a fine thing to do. Mm-hmm. Um, in the process of that, I also finally purchased a commercial license for Caddy, which we probably should have done since we were using it commercially <laughs> which which does include uh some basic support so i've been emailing back and forth with them trying to like you know i you know logging every we're logging everything like going through our logs and being like hey you know what's this mean and yeah and uh, what is this what does this error mean and why doesn't this ssl handshake work and um basically trying to get things back so that you know most if not all uh, secure requests work properly. Yeah. So, I mean, I was like already tired yesterday. Yeah. And then to have to do that on a Sunday night is, it's just, it's frustrating. And I, I you know, I feel bad for our customers who, you know, mm-hmm. uh, had like a couple, couple hours of downtime. And, and even today, I think a couple of things aren't working properly, but mostly it's back to normal. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's just like you, you're doing it. You're trying to fix the stuff like you're trying to like do it as fast as you can and you're and you're tired and you're like, I don't want to make any mistakes. Mm hmm. Oh, it's just. Yeah. Yeah. It's rough. One of the nice things about sharing our journey is that John and I aren't trying to pretend to be like a big corporate machine. Like we're real human beings that are trying to build the best thing we can yeah. for people. And we really do. Like the first thing John said after this was fixed is I feel so bad for our customers. Like that is just guilting himself. Like I feel bad that this happened. That's that amount of downtime is just not acceptable. Yeah. I just, I I wouldn't, I wouldn't want that for like a platform that I'm paying for. Yeah. Especially if I'm, you know, running a business through it or whatever. Yeah. As, as some people are. Now, on the flip side, our customers were incredibly gracious. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I think the advantage we had that day is that I was around my computer and um, I was just able to answer a lot of people in real time and kind of do... Uh, I was being able to handle all the incoming... Tri- triage? Triage, yeah. I was just on triage. And... Uh, you know that worked, and I, I, my whole thing is I just tried to be as honest as I could and as, yeah. as, as fast as I could with responses. So yeah, and I, I am definitely grateful for that. And I think that's the great that people were understanding. People, you know, they they reached out because they 
cared about us. Like they were saying, hey, just so you know. And I couldn't believe like, <laughs> it was actually, the nice thing is I, I got a, a lot of messages from listeners. So like my buddy, Sean McCabe texted me, hey, John, Justin, I'm trying to download an episode from Transistor Uh-oh. and I'm getting all these things. I'm like, oh, we already know about it. Thanks so much for letting me know because it shows that people care. It wasn't like he was like, <laughs> no, no one reached out in a mean and cynical way. They're all saying, hey, just so you know, it looks like, you know, your certificate expired. Yeah. And um, that was, that was in some ways just really nice. Yeah. It's not like we have, uh, you know, a full DevOps team over here working around the clock mm-hmm. from different time zones. Yeah. <laughs> and, yes, exactly. And and maybe someday, but you know. And to be fair, um if from even most apps that you need to be on all the time, uh for it to go down on a Sunday is not the worst thing in the world. Yeah. All the podcast apps just basically this isn't exactly how it works, but they just wait until the app becomes a, the the feed becomes available again. So the fact that feeds were unreadable for a couple hours doesn't mean no, no one didn't get their podcast downloaded as soon as it was back up. Right. Everyone And it doesn't it doesn't mean that these other apps or platforms will like remove your feed from circulation. No. 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 And I checked Apple Podcasts right during it and they were showing errors and then afterwards they, you know, they uh yeah. crawl the feed again. They yeah. they you know, uh, fetch the feed again. And once they see that it's valid, they're good to go. So, yeah. Uh, so all in all, uh, yeah, definitely uh, some lessons learned. It was, it was definitely stressful. I think we'll certainly be in a better place. Like I, I, there was just nothing to tell me that renewals were not being automatically done. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, Kind of annoying. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's the, the, yeah. I mean, we're, we're, it, it's hard to figure out what could have, cause I, I run Let's Encrypt on a bunch of my stuff. Um, so in one case, I've just had someone write a, a script that just runs on Digital Ocean that just renews it for me. Mm-hmm. In the other case, while well, Flywheel just has something on their end that runs renewal scripts. And WP Engine has scripts on their end. But in all three of those cases, I'm depending on an external service hmm. to automatically renew those certificates. Right. Or hopefully tell you if it, it didn't renew. Yes, yeah. Yeah, hopefully tell you if it didn't renew. So that there's probably something, and I'm sure we're gonna get folks, and feel free, folks, to if if you have advice or tips. Um, you know, some folks were saying they only use certs from Cloudflare because they're 15 years, and you know there might be reasons why we can or cannot do that. But um, I I still love Let's Encrypt. I think that their mission is is um, I support them in their mission to make SSL free for folks. Yeah, I think it's it's great. It's a lot. You know, it's really um, I was we couldn't really do free SSL for our custom sites without it. Mm-hmm. Um. That said, it it is definitely still new. Mm-hmm. So is so is Caddy the web server we're using. Yeah. Though I haven't, you know, I really have no complaints about it. Aside from, you know, not renewing our certificates, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but they've been, you know, I, they've been good. They've been really, yeah, helpful and quick to respond over email. So yeah, um, yeah. There's there's also I think. There has been, uh, there's a tension here, like just like so many things. So on one hand, it is like, I love it when David Hanemeyer Hansen, like when it, when they have downtime at base camp, he gets on Twitter and blogs and everything. And he says, I am so sorry this happened. We do not want this to happen again. This is why it happened. And this is, you know, what we're doing to remedy it, all that stuff. And I want us to be the kind of company that does that. We are really sorry that this happened for our customers. On the other hand, there's this tension, which is, this is, <laughs> let's not um, o- over dramatize things either. That you know, this is the internet. The internet is tied together by duct tape and crazy glue, 
and sometimes things are going to break. And there are so many dependencies down the line. Uh, everybody, you know, everybody yeah. listening that could give us some advice on how we could improve also has lots of examples on how something they built wasn't quite right. reliable all the time because there are so many places where things can break down. Well, yeah, there's a lot of moving parts. And, you know, I think myself, a lot of people, myself included, will say like, well, this is, you know, this is a solved problem. Like you should be able to not have this happen. But yeah. everyone's everyone's situation is so much different that uh, it's it's hard to predict. This is real life. <laughs> it's it's so easy to, from the sidelines, you know, me included, to, from the sidelines to go, well, why would that ever happen? That, you know, but once you're in it, you, and you're running it every single day. Um, yeah. So I think let's do a quick, what worked, what didn't work, what could we do better? Yep. Um, what didn't work? Yeah. What let's didn't see. work? What, start uh, with that. we didn't, we didn't necessarily have automatic notifications that our main, our dashboard was down. Mm -hmm. Like we didn't, necessarily know right as it happened um there's certainly checks we could have in place that would say hey you're you know maybe we put checks in place that say that ask our server when our certificates renewing mm -hmm. or expiring and, and like warn us ahead of time if it has not been renewed yet mm -hmm. that or we buy a certificate we actually don't use let's encrypt for our main domain yeah and that if something happens with renewal, it's only for the custom domains. Yeah, for our customers, you mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think like maybe putting too much, putting too much. Uh, I don't know, like reliance on things automatically working. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not enough uh, redundancy. Right. Right. I mean, in terms of what worked. People told us right away. <laughs> yeah. People told us <laughs> right away um, and on on lots of channels. And I think this is the advantage of us being a platform that serves creators, people creating podcasts, but also serves consumers, people consuming podcasts. Uh, because we heard from, I, I think we actually heard from the consumers first. We heard from people that listened to shows hosted on Transistor that couldn't get their favorite show. Yeah, and so that was that was nice, um, and that is probably just a feature of the ecosystem we're in. We are going to hear from people pretty quickly um, on SMS, Twitter, you know, email. Like I got, I got it coming in everywhere. So um, that that worked. Uh, I also think that uh, status.transistor.fm. Um, that site that I built, it's just a static site, but being able to update things and just have a central place to, to send people. So people would email in, Hey, is your stuff down? I'd be like, yes, I'm so sorry about this. Here's what's mm -hmm. happening. Just go to status.transistor.fm for updates. Uh, and then I could pin that to the top of our Twitter. Uh, it was just very helpful for clearly communicating. This is where we're at. This is what's down. And then a longer explanation of kind of what happened. Oh, the other thing that was nice is, so we have status.transistor.fm on GitHub pages. So it was up. Mm -hmm. Marketing site is on Flywheel and it was up. And so I was able to put a banner on our marketing site yeah. that just said, uh, for users trying to log in, our, we're doing some SSL maintenance right now. You won't be able to access the dashboard Here's the details, and they were able to click on that. Um, yeah, there's also, you know, along with, I guess, what didn't work, back to that, and, and like, not enough redundancy is, is there are there are ways with some extra work and some engineering to sort of separate out. Um, and I kind of, I kind of thought ahead with this and, and made the RSS feeds their own subdomain and our our like media 
um, URLs, their own subdomains, so that mm-hmm. you can actually eventually split those off into their own things, mm-hmm. their own services. So if like the dashboard goes down, people can still RSS feeds will still work and mm-hmm. audio files will still work. Mm-hmm. Um, so that is, you know, that's a that's a down the road kind of thing where we can kind of siphon some of those off into their own services and make sure they're like, okay, so like feeds. Feeds is now running on its own thing with its, with its own a self certificate that doesn't expire for two years or whatever. And, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Cause you've got good bones there. We just needed to if we had if we had separate SSL. I mean, maybe that's somewhere where we use like Cloudflare certs is on RSS feeds and media URLs. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, in terms of what we could do better. What what are some of your ideas there? Well, I mean, obviously, internally, have some better like early warning systems for things that for things like SSL certificates expiring. Mm-hmm. Um, because we are depending on auto renewal, mm-hmm. we should be able to. I think we can certainly programmatically check things and and like email ourselves mm-hmm. if if they're going to expire without um, being renewed. Another one I was thinking about was. I think when we're small like we are right now, it doesn't make sense for us to hire a full-time DevOps person, but maybe we need to hire like Joe or somebody as a backup. So mm-hmm. if we if we need somebody and I'm like the so let's say you know, we have some automated messages that message us, but we also have like if it's if I'm there and I'm awake, but you're yeah. gone. I I can try to contact you. If I can't get a hold of you, I can contact Joe. Yeah. And we just pay him hourly right. for because that would be awesome. Um that'd be great. Yeah. If I'm if I'm on my two week silent yoga retreat. Yeah. <laughs> and uh <laughs> if you're like if you're high on ayahuasca or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in another dimensional plane, plane of existence. Yeah, <laughs> we uh, there's someone else to to call. To call. I, I um, and I mean certainly I think I could get more of that stuff too. Like there's no reason that I can't learn some of that. But a a a probably a stronger fix is to have one or two contractors. Yeah. That um, if I can't get a hold of you, um, I can just contact them and yeah. you know that then. Right away, we have people that know our setup and can go, okay, yeah, I know, and yep. charge us hourly. Yeah, I mean, another thing I think I kind of joked about with you over text messaging is like, I think I said something like, oh, man, I need a I need a MacBook that's the size of my phone. Yeah. So I can just like <laughs> open it up and fold it and like type stuff. Because I, I, I couldn't really, there's nothing I could do for my phone, which is another thing like yeah. that, we've, that we've talked about in other episodes is like maybe there's certain things that we should be able to do from our phones like in this in this case would have been a little tough but yeah um i don't know maybe there's a way to like force force renew a a certificate or Mm. like restart servers from your phone or yeah you know stuff like that so yeah no i yeah i think that's a good idea because invariably it always happens like that how many times dear listener if you're listening, how many times have you been out like with friends out for drinks or hiking or something and something comes in on your phone? And you're like, oh, shit. I, yeah. How am I going to do this from my phone? And yeah, maybe what we need is on our admin side. We just need a few buttons that have some pre-scripted things that we know we might need yep. one day. Yep. Um, these phones are great. Like it's more computing power than they had when they landed people on the moon. Oh, way more. I mean, it's more computing power than I had on my first computer. But the by far. But they yeah. suck for getting things done. Yeah, they they are so I mean, bad. I mean, I could you know I can I can install an SSH app on my phone and I could probably log into our servers and do some stuff, but like. I'm doing it from an iPhone keyboard. Yeah, no, it's terrible. It's awful. It, there needs to be, 
That would actually be, if someone has like an Amazon uh, gift pack or something, that's just like a little external monitor for a phone and a keyboard, and it just like folds into a little thing. And it's just like, you could just break it out and go, okay, now I've got actual like <laughs> the, the emergency pack, you know? Oh, like a rollable keyboard and a rollable screen. Oh yeah. I mean, do you remember when the Palm came out? The Palm Pilot was my college computer because I had a foldable keyboard and I would just like fold it out and like type all my notes on this Palm. It was, really? a, it was amazing. Huh. Yeah. I could type so the, – the Palm was so slow. I would type the whole lecture and then I would have to wait like 10 minutes after the lecture was done for the, the screen to catch. <laughs> yeah. I mean you can, you can hook a Bluetooth keyboard up to your iPhone. It's true. It's just that who's going to, I'm not going to carry that with me. I know, I know. That's, I'm just thinking like laptop is, laptop is still big. Even if you get a small one, it's, it's like, and, and there's also this feeling, again, there's tension here too, because we, we don't want to handcuff ourselves and have to bring a laptop like when we're out on a date or when we're like, getting you know going on a family retreat or we're right that's a that's a bad life to be yeah that's that that is a big downside of a small company like this Mm -hmm. is that it's sort of unavoidable yeah for a while yeah i like that idea of hiring some contractors on hire though because yeah if we're gone it's so easy to just text them and say hey just so you know i'm going you know, away from keyboard for whatever, and to say, hey, are you going to be around? And then they just know, okay, I might get a call, and if I do, I know what to do, you know? It, yeah. That, that seems like a, a really great solution to, you know, not being able to hire a full DevOps person. Just have, yeah, but yeah, just to alleviate a little bit of stress. Yeah, totally. So, yeah, that was, <laughs> do, do you want to say anything else about that? I don't know. I'm pretty tired today. <laughs> well, let me tell you about our second sponsor. Today's episode <laughs> is also brought to you by Balsamic. This is a company I really look up to. If Transistor ever becomes a tenth of what Balsamic has achieved, we would be very happy. Um, here's what's amazing about them. They've, they've done really well. They're bootstrapped. They're extremely profitable. And this allows them to do things that other VC-driven companies can't do. For example, every year, they budget, this is incredible to me, $350,000 for sponsoring events. Wow. They just like giving back to the user experience community that they serve, the entrepreneurial community. So right now, this instant, uh, MicroConf is going on in Las Vegas. Well, they sponsored that. And I've seen them sponsor other kind of design and uh, user experience UI conferences. Also, they give 3% of their profits to charity each year. And their employees get to choose which causes they support. So they're giving to schools, nonprofits. Yeah. It's, it's really, really cool. You can see all of what they're doing when you go to balsamic.com slash giving back. And you might even qualify for something on that page, by the way. Um, if you are running a charity or if you have an event or, you know, you'd like them to sponsor something, balsamic.com slash giving back. All right. So, um, one thing I wanted to talk about last week that we didn't have time for is, uh, where we get a lot of our revenue from right now. And in the, in the, uh, aim of being transparent and just telling people about our journey, I thought this would be an interesting topic. Um, some people don't know, but we currently have an affiliate program. And so if you have a newsletter, a high traffic blog, maybe a big social media following, maybe you're an agency and you're often recommending tools to customers, you can refer folks to Transistor with your own affiliate link. And if people sign up for a paid plan with that affiliate link, we give 25% of that revenue forever, as long as that customer is paying (laughs) us. And uh, I thought this would be interesting because 
there's not very many people in our industry that are doing this. Uh, some folks will give you a Amazon gift card if you refer somebody. Some folks will give you a one-time payment if you refer somebody. We're doing 25% of revenue on going. And that means, for example, if you're following our transparent uh, benchmarks on transistor.fm slash barometrics.com, you'll see that we are getting very close to $10,000 recurring monthly recurring revenue. We're at 9529 It's awesome. It's really exciting. We're, we're aiming for that 10K milestone. But that's not the whole story. And uh, it's not 25% of that number is affiliates, but a big chunk of that number is affiliate revenue. And yeah, I thought it would be interesting to talk about it. Yeah. So I'm trying to... I'm trying to figure out the last time I calculated this, I think 28% of our revenue so far has come from affiliates. I think that's right. Let me, I'm just going to log in here. We're using Get Rewardful for running our affiliate program. Um, can you explain a little bit about how it works with Stripe? Because all I know is that it's better than what I've used before. It just, it seems really simple, but how does it work with Stripe? With Rewardful? Yeah. So, yeah, it is it is a really simple integration. Um, when you give out your affiliate link, yeah. our sign-up page knows uh, that it's tied to your affiliate account. So when that person signs up, there is a little bit of metadata that gets you can attach to a Stripe account. So it just says, like, I don't know, Rewardful account. And then the value is the name of your rewardful account, I think, something like that, or yeah. your ID of your user. Yeah. And then our Stripe account is hooked up to Rewardful. So Rewardful actually gets uh, webhooks for successful payments. Mm -hmm. So when, uh, when there's a payment on Stripe that goes through successfully, um, we get webhooks and so does Rewardful. And if Rewardful gets a payment for an account, that is that was signed up for through an affiliate link. Yep. Uh, they basically say, "All right, twenty five percent of this, or however we have it set up at the time, twenty five percent of this um, is a commission that you owe so and so." Yeah. And then it just sort of like adds their account up. Yeah, and the the cool thing is that, like, I can I'm looking in Stripe right now, for example, at a customer that just signed up. And in the metadata section of that customer, I can see their transistor user ID, which is what we add, but then I can see the referral ID, who the, the affiliate is, what campaign they signed up through, what link they used, and then I can view that, uh, that whole thing in Rewardful. So I can see, you know, how much have we paid out for this particular referral. And after the fact, this happens all the time, if somebody um, says, hey, I referred this customer, but I forgot to give them my link, we can go in and edit that metadata manually in Stripe and give that affiliate credit for that sign up. And these are things that in other affiliate programs I've used, you just can't do. So it's it's really great. Um, and it it only works with Stripe. So it's really clean. It just, it just works, which is the helpful part. Uh, so here's how much has happened so far. Total volume. We've done about $55,000 in revenue. Six, about 16,000 of that is referral income. So that's about 29% of total revenue of gross revenue has come through our affiliates. And the inspiration for this was, this is something I saw work with my friend Nathan Berry, who runs ConvertKit. Um, they really, you know, he, he started ConvertKit five or six years ago, and it kind of petered along at, you know, went up to $5,000 a month in recurring revenue, but then it went down to 1500 or something. And it just wasn't growing. It was 
kind of floundering. And there's a number of things that he did that changed it. But I think the the main one was he started to leverage affiliates. He started to say, you know, if you are already recommending, uh, you know, email service providers, recommend ConvertKit, and you will get uh, a share of the income forever. And, you know, if you... Uh, if you're already recommending tools, that's quite attractive, right? Mm -hmm. And so seeing this work for Nathan, I thought this might be something we want to look into, but I kind of just left it. I was like, ah, whatever. We'll, we'll, th we'll get to it when we get to it. And Kyle Fox was building Rewardful and he just kept bugging me. Like, <laughs> Justin, can you ask John if you guys are going to, you know, implement this. And I was like, oh, I don't know. Okay. And then Kyle would like bug me and ask to do like a, uh, you know, a screen share so he could show me things. And, and Kyle's been a friend for a long time. It shows you kind of how tenacious you have to be sometimes. <laughs> Cause he, had, yeah. he really had to work. He was. And it was actually, it was really easy to set up. Mm -hmm. I think we, we set it up and I sort of, I forgot about it. I honestly didn't, re I didn't realize like how much, it was being used. Yeah. Or who, like who was using it. Yeah. In necessarily. some, in some ways me too. <laughs> and, um, just like a lot of things, it's, I don't know if this is the 80, 20 rule. This might be more like, I think with affiliates, it's like there's the 99% and then there's the 1% or the 90, 10 <laughs> rule. Maybe there's a few affiliates that drive almost all of this affiliate revenue. Uh, because most folks just don't have the audience, right? Right. Uh, so I know, for example, for Nathan, Pat Flynn, who has a huge blog and a huge podcast and has tons of folks, you know, Pat saw ConvertKit, really liked it, said, this is way easier to use than MailChimp. I'm going to start using it. And then he said, well, I'd like to start recommending this to my audience and Nathan said, well, if you recommend it to your audience, I will give you a share of, you know, I'll give you commission. And that drove a, a ton of sales for ConvertKit because he, because Pat has a big audience. Uh, likewise, um, we have a few affiliates that drive most of our affiliate sales. And, you know, some of these people just heard about it through other folks. It was just word of mouth. Uh, I, cause I shared this with just a few people and they told other people about it and that's how the word kind of spread. Yeah. That's the thing. Like, I don't remember either of us really publicly announcing an affiliate program. It's not really on our site. Yeah. There's a page. Like if you go to transistor.fm oh. <laughs> right. slash affiliates, <laughs> there you go. but it's not like that. It's not like that page is getting a ton of traffic. Um, I think I've announced it a few times on Twitter. But it's, yeah, it's not something that we've, we pushed super hard. It was mostly, uh, I think, word of mouth. Just, Which is kind of amazing, mm -hmm. again, how much, how much revenue is coming from it. Um, yeah. How, how, do you, how do you feel about it now when you look at the numbers? Like, yeah. Like, f for me, I, I'm totally okay with it. I don't necessarily think the people that have signed up and stuck with us would have otherwise mm -hmm. would have found out about us. Yeah. Um, although I don't know if you turn these on or if Kyle just started the thing where we actually, now we get emails. I just started getting emails from rewardful to my email at transistor. I don't know if you get them too, but it's like there's a new commission for so-and-so. Oh yeah. I just turned and it actually, I just oh, turn, you turn those on. I just oh, turned okay. that off for myself. I think. You, okay. Yeah. See, I did. I think Kyle, maybe Kyle just rolled that out. Yeah. And I actually don't like seeing it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you you can manually turn it off now. Okay. Yeah, I saw that, but like I haven't yet. But it's just like I'd rather not know. Yeah. Like I'm fine with the commission. I'm fine with the affiliate program and like giving commission, but like. Yeah, I, I was totally fine not knowing <laughs> how much money we were giving out. Yeah, 
I mean, th there is kind of two sides to this. I was actually, I was talking to my wife about this and she was like, what? You give how much? Because it's forever. And so there's, yeah. there's this, there's two sides of this. Um, on one hand, it's like, wow, that's a big chunk of revenue that you're giving up. On the other hand, <laughs> that it, there's got to be um, a way for us to compete. And the one way for one way for us to, you know, get more folks signing up that wouldn't normally hear about us, to, to be honest, I'm surprised there's a ceiling to how many people from your personal audience and your personal network will sign up. Right. And when you're brand new and you're still trying to build up, you know, your search engine optimization and we haven't even started advertising yet. And, you know, word of mouth is going to, you know, play a piece in this, but word of mouth is amplified as you get more customers. So as you get more customers, they tell their friends and, you know, you get some of that rolling. But in the beginning, you need channels and really startups and products live and die by efficient channels. You got to have efficient ways of getting to the customers. Yeah, it is. I, I think it's still, you mentioned advertising. I think it is a really inexpensive way to advertise because you're not like with most advertising, you spend the money and hope you get the customers, but with affiliate programs, you, you, you're spending the money after you have the customers. That's right. Yeah. You, you know, so, that you're going to get them. I think there's also this this thing. What one thing that really worked for Nathan and ConvertKit because it was the same thing. Mailchimp, they have an affiliate program, and everybody says it sucks. So, and I should say, people that kind of refer things uh, or are are big in the affiliate space, they're all like, "Oh, the Mailchimp affiliate program, it's brutal, right?" <laughs> I love it. There's like, yeah. It's just fun. I don't know why. It's it's like... <laughs> I I I realize that some people think this affiliate thing is yucky, and I'm I'm trying not to dance around it too much. Um, there are people who you know, professional bloggers, influencers, quote unquote. Uh, you know, there's people who recommend products for a living, and I think just like anyone, in, in a sense, it's like. It's very similar to advertising. So when Marco Arment takes advertising money for his podcast and then recommends a product, um, that's like a, a upfront affiliate payment. They're saying, mm -hmm. we are giving you this money, hoping that you will give us a return on this ad. Uh, affiliate is a, is a, a, a back, uh, so that's a front end payment. Uh, affiliates is a back end payment. If you refer us, refer paying customers to us, then we pay you a commission just like we, you would a salesperson. Yeah. And yeah. Av I mean, advertising has changed so much on the internet in the past 10 years that people that used to make money, you know, with Google AdWords, mm -hmm. they don't, you know, they're not making anything on that anymore. Yes. And they're still providing good content. So yeah. Yeah. This is another way for independent, um, like, a few of our biggest affiliates are just independent blogs that are blogging about the podcast space. And so yeah. they, they make their living um, writing about, you know, podcasting and podcast news and things like that. And then on, as a part of that, they're recommending products and you legally in the United States, at least you have to uh, say that you're, these are affiliate links. You have to say, you know, these are promotional links. Um, and what most folks say is, you know, these are products I would be recommending anyway, but when you use my link, it lets them know that I sent you and uh, in, in, uh, I get paid for that. I get, I get some compensation for that. But it's actually very, podcasting advertising was actually built on this model, uh, right? Like for a long time, I, I, whenever someone asked me, you know, hey, I need to sign up for Hover or whatever. I always said, oh, just use the code Dan Benjamin. <laughs> <laughs> because that was Dan Benjamin's five by five code. Yeah. Right? Well, that's a that's a affiliate link. Every time someone signed up for a domain on Hover, he got uh, some affiliate money, right? 
so there's two sides of this. On one hand, I go, oh man, that is a lot. That gross, 25% right. of that revenue is being paid out to affiliates. And that, man, that, that feels like a lot of money. It does. But I have a feeling that we would be, our revenue would be much lower than that yes. had we not yes, had it. Yes, definitely. And so uh, it just gives people another incentive. Now, this isn't a good, it's, it, this doesn't work if you're just casually recommending Transistor to your friends, which you should do anyway. <laughs> like casual kind of recommendations, it doesn't work well for it. Those folks generally don't end up earning any kind of income from it. This only works for folks that have a big audience, uh, like a big podcast, um, where they can recommend, you know, something and have a lot of people respond. And so, mm -hmm. um, to access that audience, we could pay upfront through an ad, or we could pay on the back end with affiliates. And it would actually it'll be interesting for us to compare those two. Um, maybe it is more efficient to actually just pay for an ad. Um, yeah, it's not really something we've tried yeah. yet. And th and that's something actually I'd like to track through Rewardful. You can create these campaigns. So, you know, in this affiliate campaign, we have 25% commission, but I could create another campaign that's called Ads that gives 0% commission, um, but I you just use the links for tracking. Yep. Yeah. And so we'll be able to track that and go, okay, well, actually, this is much more, this is way more efficient for us to, to, to do ads or whatever. Or if, if you become dis, disillusioned and dis, you know, upset about how much, how much we're paying you, yeah. you could set up your own affiliate program and not tell me yeah. about it <laughs> and then pay yourself That's a bunch right. of money. That's right. Uh, I'll just, <laughs> I'll just, uh, exactly. Yeah. This is a way of me siphoning off money from the company. <laughs> uh, oh, and the other thing right now is we can only, we have to pay out affiliates manually. Um, and yeah. so I only do it when people have reached a hundred dollars. So if you are an affiliate and you haven't got a payment yet, it's because you haven't reached a hundred dollars in accrued commissions yet. Yeah. And we could certainly automate that. I believe, um, Kyle has an API. With yeah. They're, it. they're, they're working on it. That's, that's like, we could, we can certainly automate yeah, that. Eventually yeah. through, I think through PayPal. Yeah. Or something. Eventually we're going to, that will all be automated. I'm sure people are going to have questions about this because this is the number one thing people ask me is how are you guys getting customers? And um, this has definitely been a significant channel. Like we've, we've gotten a lot of paying customers from affiliates yeah. and they don't all stick around, but you know, even in our chat widget, when people ask for help, I always ask, Hey, so how did you hear about us? And Often it's like, oh, I was like reading, you know, reading this guy's blog and he recommended you along with some other ones. So I checked you out and I really liked your player. So I chose you. It, 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 it can be depending on what kind of product you have. I, I know, for example, Basecamp tried affiliates for a while and it really didn't work for them. If you're interested in trying this channel, it might make sense to, uh, to check it out and uh, of course, there's other ways of doing it too. You don't have to have as high of a commission. Um, you could do one time, although I don't know if Rewardful supports that yet. But yeah, there's there's other ways to run it. I, I think that's what I was going to say is that I part of me feels good about this because <laughs> we're really um, benefiting from these audiences that people have built for a long time. And just like I want creators to get paid for the work that they do, I want to pay these creators, these people that are are making content or recording podcasts or whatever. And if uh, be, becoming a Transistor affiliate helps them to make an independent living, I'm all game for that. I think that's great. And 25% um, feels generous. Like it feels like... This is, we're, we're really, you know, we're, we're trying to take care of the people that are helping us. So, yeah. A anything else you want to say about that? Uh, not really, other than I'm, you know, pleasantly surprised by how well it works. Yeah. And, and it's also funny how, how it was kind of accidental. Um, yeah. So, 
Well, let's uh, let's run through our Patreon supporters. We've got we've got a couple yeah. new ones. We we do, yeah. Um, let's see here. As always, thanks uh, to our supporters on Patreon for for helping out with the show here and helping us pay for our editing costs. Uh, we have a few, a couple new ones here. Michael Sitver. Yeah. Do you know? Do you I don't know, know Michael. Michael. Uh, actually, I might know okay. Michael. I I do know Paul Jarvis and Jack Ellis. They. They support it on behalf of Fathom Analytics. That, okay. That, some people are figuring out how to get a little like uh, commercial shout out here at the end of their. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, they're gaming the system. It's fine. My brother Dan Buddha uh, at Daniel Buddha on Twitter, danbuddha.com. Yep. Uh, Darby Frey, Samori Augusto, Dave Young, Brad from Canada, Kevin Markham, Sammy Schukert, Dan Erickson, Mike Walker. Adam Devander, Dave Junta, <laughs> Kyle Fox from GetRewardful.com, which we were just talking about, and our other sponsors, uh, Clubhouse and Balsamic. Yes. Thanks, everyone. And we will see you next week. <laughs> <laughs>